honor the God of the Bible. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we thank God for this day. Thank God for all of you. Thank God for the activity of our limbs. It is not a given. There's been mornings I woke up, I had a big old plan for the day. And then my mind on my body said no. Changed all my plans. But I thank God for each and every opportunity that I get, that we get to show forth his glory. The power of God in our life, the things that God blesses us with, the things that, the things that God keeps us in, keeps from us. This is an example of his glory and his mercy in us. And we want to be reminded of that because some people have not arrived there yet. And it's our job and our privilege to show folks the goodness of the Lord and to help people to understand none of us gets there instantly. It's a process. And we thank God for every day in the process that he allows us another day in the process. And it's a good thing because it's faith in somebody's prayers that have got us there, have got us to where we are. And God does it because he's that kind of God. And it's so unfortunate that one day the unbeliever is going to realize how wrong they was. And we claim to be so smart and intelligent but Jesus says we, we know when to plant the harvest. We know when to reap the harvest. He says, but we can't tell the times. And we can't recognize his presence in our life. Again, we thank God for Brother Wooden this morning being with us. So glad that he could be with us. Let's go in our Bibles. We're going to stay in the book of Joel. We started there on Wednesday night. And the Lord came in and at some point in time, I don't think he was pleased with us. And so we shut down. We stopped. And uh, I remember going home and, and me and my wife traveling and what should have been a five minute trip seemed like it took so long to get home. But one thing I know, how God has been, how good God has been to me and my marriage and in my family, that no matter what might come up between me and that young lady back there, we will figure it out. Amen. We don't allow strife or differences that are hindrances to stay in our home. So, but God gave us another opportunity. We will take advantage of it today. Thank God for our viewing audience, our Facebook Live, and our youth and our YouTube audience that's coming online. We're so honored to be here. We thank God for all of you that are in the house of the Lord this morning. I want to go to the book of Joel, chapter number 2. I want to start at verse 14. Just how the boys doing. Great. Good. They're growing up. Yes. They're growing up. You tell Crayon, he owed me the opportunity of looking at his face. <laughs> Amen. I know he's out of town now, so... Then Sister Red is going to have to put your location in my GPS so if we're in that area, we can stop by there and, and see him. Amen. The book of Joel, chapter 2. Can y'all start our timer? We have to pay for some of this online timing, so. Amen. Again, we thank God for Miss Lester being here. She is so busy these days. And we, we just keep her up in prayer. 
churches out there on the road saving souls and healing the sick and the wounded and a lot of that time she's out there by herself amen one morning a tree almost fell on her car driving down the highway she was out there by herself but God but God my dear friend Sister Bobby she's always a presence in the community in the people's lives that she she impacts. And of all the bad that it represents, you know, God places things in our midst for the good. Now, wherever there's an opportunity for good, people can also use it for bad. But God intended the instruments that, that he, the instruments that he's given us for good. And one of those instruments that is good is that, you know, Facebook and our different uh, media technologies. They, they give us an opportunity to stay in touch, whereas back in the day we didn't have that opportunity. Uh, my wife is, 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 she still believes in picking up the phone and hearing your voice. And now that they got uh, uh, FaceTime, it ain't even good enough just to hear your voice. They be FaceTime. Talk to the kids and family every day. And me, you know, half the time, Jessica, I've been on hand on my 7 o'clock in the morning. Look, I ain't trying to face nobody at 7 o'clock. Then later on in the morning, I see where my daughter be done sent pictures to everybody in the family with a FaceTime and my wife at 6.30 in the morning. And uh, she's always beautiful to me. But she gets so perplexed when she'd be like, I called you to talk to you. Why are you taking snapshots of my best time? Amen. But because of that medium, I've been able to keep up with Joyce and Jessica. I, I keep up with them that way. I keep up with people I went to high school that way. And if it wasn't for that, Lord knows we would have no idea where these people are or what they're doing. But every now and then I'll pop it open and there's Sister Bobby and the Dallas Cowboys or Kansas City Chiefs out there. <laughs> no Dallas. <laughs> yeah, well, Kansas City or 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 uh, old. Washington Rich is out there. And I tell her wife, I said, there goes Joy, she's doing good. She's still at it. Amen. <laughs> Let's look at what the Lord is saying to us this morning through the book of Joel, starting at verse, chapter 2, starting at verse number 12. The Bible says, Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart. And with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. He said, rend your heart and not your garments. And turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Now what he means by that, God doesn't stay mad with us. God doesn't repent in the way that we repent because God has no reason to repent in the way that we repent because God has never done anything that would be considered repentance worthy. Amen. What he means by that is maybe he won't be angry with us long. That was the mistake that Moses made that caused him to not be in to be able to enter into the promised land. He portrayed an image of God that did not accurately reflect God. God was not angry with the people in the way that Moses was. And when the Lord said to Moses, go speak to the rock and it will send forth water. Moses being angry because people were defying God took his staff and struck the rock and then kicked it. 
And it caused him to not be able to enter into the promised land. So God wants us to recognize where it is he's not pleased in our sin and our disobedience. He never wants us to think that he's cast us away and we have no opportunity to return. And so we have to be careful as carriers, as teachers and preachers of God's word to remind God's people that God is in the delivering business because we need to be delivered. And there is nothing that God can't deliver us out of. So God says, tell people about the things we do that are not right. And also let them know that God is gracious and merciful. Otherwise, he wouldn't tell us nothing. See, the enemy lets you walk in a trap. And his whole plan is to not tell you you're going into a trap. I watch sometimes when I'm out walking the dog. And when I'm walking down through the tree line on the property. I have to put my glasses on now because I start walking into spider's web. Some of them spiders be pretty big. And then I step back and I'll be like, whoa, that one could have done some damage. And then sometimes I'll see that spider's web and I'll see an insect caught in the web. Sometimes the spider would just be sitting there watching them tangle themselves in the web. No one they can't get out. Then sometimes when the spider sees that, okay, this guy might have the ability to get out. You see him clamoring up there right quick to pop that poison in them so they can't get out. But God warns us so that we don't get caught up in it. And if you do, the Bible says that God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and it repented him that we're in evil, it repents him that we're walking in, dis in disobedience. But the Bible says if we turn our hearts to the Lord, verse 14, who knoweth if God will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Now let's drop down to verse 16. The Lord says, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breast, even the babies. And let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach. That the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen, but I will remove far from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea. And his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up, because he had done great things. God will punish them that afflict his people, is what he is saying. But he says in verse 21, fear not. Fear not, O land, and be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. 
Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And your floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore unto you the years that the locusts had eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied. Praise the name of the Lord your God that have dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And lastly, verse 27. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. And that I am the Lord your God. And none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading of his word. I'm taking from verse 25. The Lord says, and I will restore to you the years that the locusts had eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you, and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall not be ashamed. I want to preach this morning. The conclusion of where we started on Wednesday night, the God of the locusts, the God of the locusts. God wants to remind us today that the same God that sent the locusts removed the locusts and then he restored what the locusts had, had destroyed. I don't know about you, but I am not interested in a faith that doesn't move God. I am not interested in a faith that does not keep me in the covenant promises of God. Uh, uh, a faith that is based on convenience and what I want when I want it. And not what God wants. The God of the Bible, Yahweh, Jehovah is his name. Not what he wants when he wants it. God is on the throne still. And I just want to encourage you today. To know that to have a faith that is not based on what God wants, when God wants it, is not a faith at all. It's a fairy tale. And like all fairy tales, it's a myth that does not yield true and eternal results from God. So when you when when your faith is in something that is mythical. Or when your relationship with God is based on a mythical experience, meaning you create the relationship you want to have with God, rather than God creating the relationship that you want to have with Him. When you do that, then your mythical relationship with God does not yield you the expected results that you are expecting. And when you don't get that result you stop being a true follower of God and of scripture and of Christ because you begin to tell yourself man this is not all that, that, that it's cracked up to be you know the Bible says God will do this and God will do that and God is not doing it 
So it causes your faith to be staled or stalled. But the Lord wants to us to remember on today that our faith cannot be steeped and rooted in a fairy tale or a myth. It has to be rooted in God's biblical truth. Then the word, it works. How many of you know the Bible works? The gospel works. And while we're believing that, we have to also believe that there is biblical historical documentation that when God gets tired of our slowful and willing disobedience, God will allow your enemies to act as his agent and overcome us. The Bible is replete with situations where God used the very enemies of Israel that God was protecting them from to afflict them. Why? So that we recognize that the gracious and merciful God that is keeping us, should we become rebellious and he pull his hands away, your enemies will overtake you. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is the restrainer that restrains Satan from overtaking us. So if God removes that screen, he told Satan concerning Job, I'm going to remove the hedge temporarily from Job and let you do your thing. Because God knew where Job was in his heart. But God had to remove that hedge first. To allow that evil to come in. Well, he did it to Job, who was faithful. You don't think he will do it to us, who are oftentimes not faithful. Let's look at the promise of God right quick. Uh, uh, you don't have to go there if you can't get there. But I want to go real briefly to Joshua chapter 1. I want to go to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. And the Bible says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over the Jordan, thou and all this people, Unto the land which I do give them, even the children of Israel. Then in verse 4, he says, Now from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of your life. That's a promise from God. He said uh, unto Joshua, as I was with Moses, so I shall be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. But he reminds us in Joshua 1, 6 and 7, be strong. And of good courage. For unto you, for unto this people, thou shalt divide for an inheritance the land which I swore unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong. And then he says, goes beyond good and says, very courageous. There is a reason. God doesn't say anything without purpose. There is a reason God said, you've got to be strong of good courage, then very correct, courageous, why? That thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded me. Then God warns us not to turn from it to the right hand or to the left. And there was a good reason for that, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. 
You know where they wound up going? The destination that they wound up going to now represents what we see today. We are their descendants. God said, if you stay in my word, you will prosper wherever you go. Wherever you go, Enfield, God said, you will prosper there. If we keep the commandment. So we have to recognize that now we fast forward back to the book of Joel. And when we get there, the book of Joel shows us the creator and redeemer, the God of all the universe, is in complete control of nature. God is in control. When we see the storms, the floods, the weather patterns, the eclipse that's happening today. God controls that. Not man. Joel made it clear in his book that the God of judgment is also the God of mercy who stands ready to redeem and restore his people when we come before him with repentance. Now, when Joel writes this book, he is writing to an Israel which had either already succumbed to the wickedness, or as we stated on Wednesday night, they had come to a place where they accepted it. When you live in and around sin too long and don't keep your soul dependent from it, you become numb to it. The things that used to bother you, they don't bother you anymore. So even though we may not personally take part in it, we become so numb to it that we used to correct our children about things coming up. Now we don't say a word. We used to remind them of things that they should and should not do. Now we just simply say they grow. They will learn. You are never grown in the eyes of God until you come to a place of full surrender. So God, when Joel writes this book, God wants us to know, and he wanted Israel to know, that the condition that they had gotten in since coming into Canaan, the condition that we've gotten in since God gave us deliverance, brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light, brought us from the slave house, to the White House, and now that we've been set free, God says, I need you to understand something. That when Joel wrote this, they were, Israel was in a spiritual condition where they had either succumbed to wickedness or they had accepted a culture of sin and rebellion, and that they are now getting ready to experience God's wrath. As we also will. In our experience. Now let's just talk about how far we have succumbed to it. Joel chapter 1 verse 1 and 3 gives us that. He says in verse 1 of Joel chapter 1. Actually verse 2. Hear ye, hear this ye old men and women. And give ear all Ye inhabitants of the land, had this been your days, even in the days of your father? He said, tell your children, we'll do that no more, of it. Let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. God is saying, some things we got to keep in their minds and in their hearts. Sometimes we, we reach the point in life today where we are too intelligent. To listen to old people. What do they know? I remember when my great grandmother. Not only would she read the Bible. But God spoke to them. God would tell them things. We couldn't find in the Bible. Because he's a revealing God. 
Then in verse, verse 4, God says, now watch out. Man, you really got to read Joel. It's only a couple of chapters. It's very interesting. Yeah. Because in verse 4, God tells Joel, tells them, uh, when God is talking to Joel, he said, that which the palmer worm had left, had the locust eaten. That which the locust had left, the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm didn't eat, the caterpillar ate it. We talked about this on Wednesday night. What he is describing here in a understanding that the people in that day could understand. They used the life cycle of the caterpillar. People understood that. Why? They lived off the land. And insect life during that period of time had a great impact on their food crops and on what they, what, what they were harvesting. When our life becomes disobedient toward God, he sends a warning. So as their faith in the Lord and their trust in the Lord, their surrender to the Lord became stubborn, God sent the canker worm. He sent the locust, which is really the law. People didn't repent. So what the locusts didn't eat, God turns around and he sends the canker worm. We get in a place where God says he didn't learn. So rather than sending you recovery, I'm going to send an even bigger affliction. So God sent the canker worm. The people hardened themselves, still did not repent. Now all of us, all, all this time, God is saying to us, look, the judgment is increasing. And what, and what were they doing? They were justifying it. You know, they were doing joys, they were doing sort of what we do today. Allow scientists and people to tell us why things are happening, rather than back in the day when we believed God for the weather. We believe God for the healing. We believe God for our children and our families. But nowadays we are listening to people that know not God. And then the deterioration just keeps going. But your arms are too short to box with God. So what did God do? All that the canker worm didn't eat. Uh, then the Lord sends the caterpillar. I don't know if you've ever been watching a leaf that a caterpillar was on. He does not leave anything. He takes it all. And so we find in verse 4 that when God sends judgment, there is no remedy except repentance. When God sent the locusts in 2020, we know it is the pandemic. We know there was no guaranteed defense for it. Whomever God chose to get infected, they got infected. Whomever God allowed to get sick, they got sick. Whomever God allowed to be taken from this earth, they got taken from the earth. To this day, man has not been able to adequately address why some got sick and others didn't. Why some passed away and others didn't. Why caregivers in hospitals, a lot of them didn't get sick or die at all. And they were around it every day. No matter how hard the scientists and doctors work, to this day, they never found scientific accuracy to prevent anything concerning COVID or the pandemic. And if we stop one second from listening to the talking heads on TV and look at the reality of what's in front of us, we know ourselves. We know people. We've been around people that was in the midst of this thing and never got affected. The very age 
group. Talking about my age group now. Welcome to the club, Sister Lassiter. She said she moved into the 60s. The very age group and people with debilitating conditions, that population that was deemed high risk. Most of us are still living today. Now they're saying it's afflicting the younger people. They have no idea, y'all. Come on. And while the scientists and doctors were working themselves to the bone, and God blessed them for their efforts, they worked very hard. While they were doing that, the church was praying. The church was praying. And repenting. I know I was. That's God. And God was the only cure. God is the only cure. To this day now, many of us took the vaccine. Then we took the booster. Then we took booster number two. Then we took booster number three. Then we took booster number four. Now they got another booster they just spent billions on producing. People, these measures don't work. This is God sending the locusts. People walk around, I see them today. I left my wife the other day. People riding around with their mask on in their car by themselves. I said to my wife, well, somebody riding around in the car with the mask on and in the car by themselves. I remember one time I had took my car. The, 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 the one time I got it, I had took my car to, to back to uh, Rick Hendricks Cadillac for servicing. And I tested positive about a week later. And I actually said, well, it must have been the people that got in my car and serviced my car. I mean, just anything would do. Because we didn't know. That's right. That's right. You see, I see people walking around now. I see people walking around now, and Brother Whitten, they walk around with the mask on, and it ain't over their nose. That's right. Now, what's this about? Amen. What is that supposed to do? That's the truth. We thank God here in the city of refuge. We never closed our doors, not one day. Knock on God. We're knocking on no wood. We're knocking on God, thanking God. Nobody ever, we never had an outbreak here. Nobody, no single person ever caught COVID as a result of being in here. We all caught it. Yes. But it wasn't a result of being in here. And I had a relative. I ain't talking about somebody that I don't know. I had a relative say, well, if that ain't saying nothing, you only had like 10 or 15 members. Yeah. Then I, and then I had to stick my chest out and boast. We fellowship with our bishop. Upper room in Raleigh that has 4,000 members. They never shut their doors either. And to this day, they never had an outbreak in their church. Or anybody who caught COVID as a result of being in the church. But the God of our salvation, he has a word. For he says to us in Joel chapter 2, in verse 2, he said, a day of darkness and of gloominess a day of clouds and of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains a great people and strong there hath not been ever like the like neither shall be there any more after it even to the years of many generations a fire devoured them and behind them a flame burneth, and the land of the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. When God sends the locusts, nothing prevents it. 
some of the afflictions that we are experiencing in our life today in your community, in your home, in field. It's a result of it, it's a result of our disobedience where we turn away from God. God brought us through the dark periods. God brought us through those times we didn't think we were going to make it. We look back on the years we didn't have shoes, we didn't have floors in our home, we didn't have running water. In the wintertime, we had to snug up together to stay warm. In the summertime, we stayed as far away from each other as we could so we wouldn't get hot. God kept us. And the Lord wants us to know that when we have turned our back on Him, some of the things we are experiencing is because God has not allowed the locust. God has sent it. God sent Assyria to punish the northern kingdom of Israel. God sent Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon to capture, put into captivity the tribe of Judah. God sent Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Jeremiah into captivity. God sent Nebuchadnezzar. Then God turned around and punished him. God sent Assyria to wipe out the northern kingdom. Then God turned around and banished them. They no longer exist on the earth today. Babylon no longer exists on the earth today. Nineveh no longer exists on the earth. Sodom and Gomorrah, they no longer exist because God used them to afflict the people of Israel for turning their back on God. God said the very people that you are trying to fight, I will take away your ability to defend yourself. This is what he means when he starts talking about the army that's coming. The appearance of them as is the appearance of horses and as horsemen. And God is saying you won't have a defense. People will come in your home, in your heart, in your town. They will overrun you. And you will be sitting there trying to figure out, Lord, I go to church. Lord, I believe on you. Lord, I'm doing this. Lord, I'm doing that. What is going on? But then God says to us, these things are, are happening because you are serving me with lip service. You're giving me all kinds of excuses why you can't live holy. All kinds of excuses why you won't be committed. All kinds of excuses why you won't surrender to the God of holiness. And it's a very simple reason why. We want to live a Christianity, especially in America today. We want to live a convenient holy life. It has to be a holiness of convenience. I got to get done here. It's holiness as a convenience, not holiness as a way of life. Christians today have chosen to see holiness as a only as a necessary event when we need God in times of distress. Then we get holy. Then we want to pray. We come to church when things start going bad. I'm talking to members of my own family, me and my wife. So you only think about God when you find yourself in that spider's web. God, Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor. And the heavy lady said, come to me when you're in the midst of your foolishness. Come to me when you're in the midst of your pride. Come to me when you're in the midst of your dilemma. God understands. Yes, he do. Amen. He understands that you don't come to him. But what he won't accept is that you didn't. Amen. The Lord is saying to us, got to end here now. There is a reason why things aren't getting better. 
where you live. There's a reason why things in your life aren't getting better. We read the parts of the Bible that talk about healing. We read the parts of the Bible that talk about prosperity. We read the parts of the Bible that talk about a better day. Opening up the window. Pouring out a blessing. We read the parts about the Bible that say, I'll lay hands on the sick and they shall be recovered. Then the person stays sick. That we read the part about if, 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 if I serve the Lord faithfully for a month, I'm going to walk on water like Peter. Then you get on the water and you sink. All right, then you can't figure out why. But God said, what I need you to do on today. He says I need you. To rend your heart. And not your garment. God said quit tearing up all your clothes. Why don't you tear up that dirty heart of yours. He said come unto me. I'll give you the deliverance. He said you're rending your hearts today. But you're not, you're rending your clothes, but you're not rending your heart. We've got to hold on. We got to hold on to the Lord. We got to hold on to Jesus. We got to hold on to holiness. We got to remember, church, that the great reward from God is not even here on the earth. The great reward from God is when we see Jesus. The Bible talks about a time, as the songwriter said, as the songster was singing, you don't have to worry about it no more. Right. I heard Bishop Morton singing, there is a time coming, you don't have to worry about your enemies no more. Great. You don't have to worry about sickness no more. But wow, right. we are yet on the earth. God said you've got to have some staying power. You got to be able to endure beyond the surface. You can't get tired. Okay, Lord, I, 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 I stayed faithful for two days. But you got to say, Lord, I'm going to stay faithful for three. It's all like the AA folks do it. Lord, every day I'm going to wake up. One day at a time. Every morning I wake up. I say, Lord, I thank you for this day. This is the day that you have made, I'm going to be glad and rejoice in it. And if you do that every day, one of these old days, you're not going to wake up on the earth. You're going to wake up in glory. And the Lord says, I'm going to thank you and I'm going to give you a, a just reward. But while we're on the earth, you got to get some courage about you. Oh, the Lord's told Joshua, You've got to be strong and of good courage. you got to be strong and very courageous because challenges to your faith is coming. Challenges to your belief system is coming. Challenges to your associations, they're coming. When it comes time to make holy decisions as opposed to doing what just works, that day is coming. Sometimes your friends are going to walk away from you. Them days are coming. Sometimes when what your best friends are doing and what God says you ought to do is going to cause a rift between you. But God says you got to stay for a little while until your change comes. He said miracles still exist. But what he told the apostles, he said you lay hands on the sick. And they shall recover. And I did my research on that. And that word translated from the Greek. It says you shall be better. It says you shall do well. It says you shall get better. It didn't say it was going to happen right now. We've been, been believing God. For some things in our life. For a very long time. My mother prayed for me. And ask God to deliver me. And she did it for a very long time. My wife, she prayed for me. And she believed God. And God can guarantee you, it didn't happen overnight, brother. But she had to stay in that thing. First 
some wild. God's telling us, you've got to get into that place where you live holy as a lifestyle. You've got to believe God as a lifestyle. No matter who's doing wrong, you've got to do right. If you find yourself coming up short, say, Lord, I need you to open up a way for me. I'm coming up short, Lord. Don't know what I'm going to do. I've got enemies, Lord. They're more powerful than me. They're smarter than me. They got more money than me. How can I survive in this? And the Lord says, you've got to lift up the name of Jesus. He said, I am with you until the end. He said, it my law come. Like the enemy is winning. He said, but that's fool's gold. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. You don't win the war. In one day. But God says the battle. Belongs to the Lord. You got to put on your war clothes now. And God will fight the battle. But the Lord is saying unto us. He said you got to turn your hearts. Back unto the Lord. Got to turn your heart. Back to what God is saying and doing. Don't cheat. Because your opponent is cheating. Don't lie. Because your competition is lying. Don't steal. Because you got to get ahead of the next person. Don't lie. Because liars will not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't set yourself up to be something that you're not. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to lift up the name of Jesus. I'm going to lift him up before the world. I'm going to lift him up. That all people might see the good works that God has wrought in us and give God glory. And we'll get, we'll get the victory. Don't worry about what you lost. Don't worry about what you think the devil took. Don't worry about that relationship. Don't worry about that job. Lord, I'm making a little less money now. Well, God said, then just live within your means. We got to be remember, remember, God wants us prepared for the evil day. God wants us prepared for when the enemy is going to overtake the weak. The enemy is going to be overtaken by them that resist God. Just like the locusts came and devoured the people of Joel's day. The locust is here now. You better trust God. But I like what the Lord said. He said, if we rent our hearts and not our clothes, if we trust God for all of our substance, he said, I will meet your every need according to the riches and glory of Christ Jesus. That means the blessing of the Lord. Make it rich and add no sorrow to it. That means that every good gift and every perfect gift, it cometh from above and cometh down from the Father of light, not the Father of darkness, where there is no variableness or chance of returning. The Lord says, you got to seek Him while He may be found. you got to call on Him while He's near. Let the wicked, I'm petitioning the wicked today, let the wicked forsake his way. The unrighteous man is thought. I'm praying for the unrighteous man. That God will fix his mind. Won't oh, let him, the unrighteous man, repent of his thoughts. Let us return unto the Lord who will have mercy on us. And unto our God who will abundantly pardon us. Then the Lord says this. He said, I will restore. I'll restore. I'll restore the years you think you lost. I'm in better shape now in my 60s than I was in my 40s. My mind is better now than it ever was. God said, I'll restore the years that the locusts have eaten. I'll restore the years that the kangaroo is eaten and the caterpillar 
and the palmer worm because God is saying they afflicted you not because you were good you were not being persecuted they afflicted you because we were doing evil but the Lord says repent come back unto me I'm speaking to somebody come back to the Lord I'm speaking to my family come back to the Lord I'm speaking to Enfield come back to the Lord the Lord said he will abundantly part He's going to restore the years. He's going to restore the good days. These shops are going to fill back up. These houses are going to stand back up. Our children are going to start praising God. There's going to be plenty. And we won't lack. Now will the villain still be here? Will the villain still be here? But I just want to remind you of this before I close. When the villain came to afflict Job. He had to ask God for permission. When Satan comes on you, he's going to have to ask God for permission. When sickness comes on you, he's going to have to ask God for permission. If some of us ask our doctors, we should have been dead a long time ago. But death has to ask permission from God. Life has to ask permission from God. But I don't know about you, but I know this that the God of the harvest, the God of the locusts, the same God that sent the locusts, is the same God that removed the locusts and restored what the locusts have eaten. Somebody ought to be glad today. Somebody ought to be glad. Bible says, When you're preaching under the anointing, under the anointing God understands that we cannot change people's hearts. Amen. You can talk to them kids all you want to. You can talk to that alcoholic, that drug addict, that prostitute, men and women, that thief. You can talk to them all you want to. You will never change their heart. Only the gospel and the power of the Holy Ghost and the anointing that God gives to them that truly represent him will ever break the yoke of evil. The power of the gospel in Jesus Christ breaks spiritual wickedness. And I say, Lord, start with me first. We don't want to be those fake evangelists that run out there claiming the gospel, Jessica, and then next week, they be in the newspaper. Next week, people be talking about what they did. They done got caught up in their mess. And we wonder why God is not moving. God does not honor faith that doesn't move him. God does not honor a faith that does not put him first. And you can't say you put God first. And your life and your belief system does not match up with God's word. But God is saying, I promise I've given you a resting place. And we're done now. I heard David say, the one thing I have desired of the Lord and that shall I seek after, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord. When things are tough, I can behold the beauty of the Lord. When things don't appear to be going right, I can behold the beauty of the Lord. I heard somebody told me a couple of weeks ago, we were in South Carolina at my son's, at my grandson's army graduation everybody was smiling man and the video was running and we we're all cheering and having ourselves a funky good time and all the while my daughter was in the emergency room at the hospital in downtown columbia at the edge of life 
that when I got back, somebody mentioned to me when I told them what was going on. They said, man, we were looking at y'all pictures. I had no idea all that was going on. And I said, because the joy of the Lord is our strength. The peace of God is our strength. I'm not a doctor. I'm not an internal medicine person. And I'm not a surgeon. We was down there for a certain event. There was nothing I could do at the hospital. Matter of fact, we couldn't even get in. So I said, Lord, we're just going to go down and do what you blessed us to do. And by the time we got back, Sister Bobby, it was all over. She was ready to go home. We honor the Lord today. I want to pray for somebody. Father, we thank you today. We give you the glory and the honor and the praise. There is none like you, Lord. And God, we repent today that we've not been what you desire and have even commanded us to be. But God, we pray that you will strengthen us by your spirit. Lord, even though we've dropped the ball and we've erred in the way, Lord, our heart is perfect toward you. Lord, we still believe that you are divine, you are the Savior, and you are merciful. We still believe the blood still works and it covers our sins. So Lord, we ask today that you will look beyond our faults and see the need. We need spiritual strength. We need spiritual courage. We need spiritual discernment that comes from you. And Lord, we need you to know that we love you and that we thank you and that we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. God keep you. Be safe out there.